Well, hello everyone and welcome to Insight with Beyond the Headlines and Political Tours. Our guest today is one of the world's leading experts on North Korea. And until 2017, he led our tours to the region. He's Rudiger Frank, Professor of East Asian Economy and Society at the University of Vienna. Welcome, Rudiger. Uh, just by a quick way of background, Rudiger, can you first say very briefly how you came to be involved in North Korea and then study it? And then in a second, we'll go on to your talk. But that's your first question. Well, good afternoon, Nick and everybody. Uh, great to be here and being able to share some of my insights on North Korea with you. Um, that topic has been on my desk for about 30 years. Uh, first time I traveled to North Korea was in October 1991. And that was in the context of me studying Korean studies, actually, at Humboldt University in Berlin. At that time, it was unified Germany and unified Berlin, but Humboldt University, as you might know, ended up being in Eastern uh, Berlin after German division. So they had particularly close ties with North Korea. And uh, the reason why I went to North Korea was simply for studying the language. And after a year of intensive language study in Berlin, it was time to actually go to the country. And going to North Korea was just the first option I got. As a student, you know, not uh, having too much money, uh, German government fully paid for that. And so I went. And uh, yes, the country has been uh, bothering me in a way. Uh, and of course, I was interested in it uh, ever since. I think the other point to mention, which is that you've got a unique perspective in that you grew up in the GDR. So you'd had experience of living within a communist system and also some experience of living in the Soviet Union as well. Yes, I was about to say that. In the mid-1970s, I spent five years in the Soviet Union, which is actually where I first came across North Korea, because my father, as a nuclear physicist, um, in the evening over, over dinner, told us this funny story about the North Koreans that they had uh, and how they were all placed in one house because um, they uh, made their own kimchi and the uh, neighbors complained about the smell, so they decided to solve that problem by putting all the North Koreans into one house so they could actually, uh, you know, smell each each other's odors. So uh, that's how I know that the North Koreans had been in Russia, actually, at that time, Dubna, nuclear research center of the Eastern Bloc. Although at that time, I, I, there was no, no way for me to know that I would ever be connected to North Korea in my professional career. Yeah. Well, it's a unique perspective because some people talk about the GDR and um, when mm -hmm. it unified and they make those comparisons, but what, with... Um, Korean unification and German unification. And we'll, we'll come on to that later to see if that's relevant at all or not. Anyway, our aim today is to give people an insight into the workings of the North Korean economy, not only at a, a macro level, but also in terms of what it means for ordinary Koreans. How do they get by from day to day? And more broadly, what does this all say about Kim Jong-un's leadership and the direction of the country overall? Rudy has got a, a talk for us, after which we're going to turn to Q&A. Do put your questions in the little box here below. So type away, you can type away as we're, as we're talking. And then we'll come a bit later and open your microphone so you can put your questions directly to Rudy. Um, so, um, Rudy, I'm going to hand it over, over to you. Um, just remember, everyone, do stay on at the top of the hour, the end of the hour, when we say goodbye to Rudiger, and we'll have our own discussion at the, at the end of the hour. Um, so do stay on for that. Anyway, Rudy, here's your talk. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Um, well, I, I will actually talk a little bit about the macro situation, and then we will work our way down to uh, the basic level, because in a way, it is interrelated, and uh, especially since we now have the year 2020, with all this COVID-19 stuff uh, going on, it uh, also didn't leave North Korea unaffected, obviously. And uh, what's more important is that uh, whatever we talk about North Korea, whatever we are concerned with, be it nuclear weapons, which gets a lot of media attention, or human rights, or humanitarian issues, or even stability of leadership in North Korea, remember, all the speculation about the whereabouts of Kim Jong-un and what happens if he's gone and so on and so on. All that in a way is uh, closely connected to the status of North Korea's economy. And that's why I think it's worthwhile uh, taking a look at what we know and also at some current data as indicators of what is happening in 2020. Um, so this is what I'm gonna do. Some data on the North Korean economy, then the impact on those issues of concern that I just mentioned and then provide something that in the field of North Korean studies we call rare glimpses, which is basically snapshots um, that you take while you travel through the country. And then the value of those actually really depends on your ability 
to interpret them and I will uh, try to do some of this uh, towards the end of my talk. Okay, so first of all, data, um, don't worry. It's not really very technical. Um, it's actually very fascinating if you think about it. Um, if, what you see here on this curve is a development of North Korea's state budget growth rates. Um, the North Koreans have stopped publishing absolute numbers for their state budget in 2002, but they, as you can see here consistently uh, on an annual basis, publish numbers on how much they expect the state budget to grow next year, how much it, uh, the uh, revenue that the state has generated has grown the previous year and, and so on. And first thing you realize when you look at that curve, it's not flat, it's not linear. Uh, you have actually many ups and downs, which is quite fascinating because Nick mentioned my background uh, of life in a socialist country until the age of 21. So I kind of know what I'm talking about. It's not like I was a toddler or something when German unification happened. And uh, I do know that the economy in East Germany has always been growing, no matter what you actually saw on the ground. Who cares? Officially, in the newspapers, there was one success story after the other. Now, look at that. And again, these are official North Korean numbers, right? That's what they tell their people. And as you see, it's not a continuous success story. There are your ups and downs. It's not like they would ever admit uh, to negative growth. Of course not. But um, you see you have tremendous growth expectations there in the early 2000s, clearly connected to economic reforms North Koreans had started back then, also the first inter-Korean summit uh, that led to a number of hopes in North Korea for a better economic development, including the opening of the Kaesong industrial zone between North Korea and South Korea. Um, they hoped in 2002 for diplomatic normalization with Japan, actually a Japanese prime minister, visited North Korea, shook hands, with Kim Jong-il, and it seems they had agreed on something like a deal, you know, diplomatic uh, normalization in exchange for huge Japanese economic contributions. There was talk about uh, of some 12 billion US dollars. Now, all that didn't materialize because at the same time, there was this US war against terror right after 9-11. In March 2003, we had the invasion of Iraq. And then in 2006, we had North Korea's first nuclear test. And then everything actually went south in terms of international economic relations. And what you also notice here on that curve, and that's almost the last thing I will say about it, since Kim Jong-un has been in power, and that's roughly, well, late 2011, um, 2012, I think we can assume that numbers from 2013 are actually closely connected to him. Um, you see the curve is much flatter. Now, of course, interpretation is always an individual thing. You could say, uh, since he's been in power, everything has been really bad. I would say, since he's been in power, they have become much more realistic and much more modest in their expectations. Um, I was just say, Rudy, just in yeah. case we have some people who phone in who actually can't see the graph here, uh, there's a, from 2001, there's a huge surge going up, and you've got a, sort of a drop down, and it comes down very dramatically in 2006, gradually goes up towards 2010 drops again in 2012, and then it sort of bumps along at a fairly low level from 2013 yep. right up until today. And if you look at the um, orange curve and the um, green curve, you also see a huge gap here. So it seems they always grow, uh, expect their um, expenditure, to, uh, expenditure to grow faster than their revenue, which basically means they have no problem with running a deficit. Although the blue, uh, blue curve actually is more like in line with the green curve. So that looks more like a balanced budget. But there are all these differences in here that are highly interesting and leave lots of room for interpretation. Now, if you look at the orange curve um, in 2020, you see that it's somewhat above 4%. And I will come back to this later because uh, the numbers, the, the other numbers they provided actually don't add up. And this is the first sign of trouble. And actually, I would say, this is basically the status of North Korea's economy in 2020. No crisis yet, but also no success story. There are more and more signs of something unusual going on. And then again, I'm going to provide a bit more detail on that. So this is one of them. 4% growth projected for 2020, and numbers um, don't really add up. Um, this is actually North Korea's trade. Now, I should say North Korea's trade, uh, not as it is reported by North Korea. They don't tell us anything about their trade. But this is as the Chinese tell it, um, mainly, because most of that is actually trade between North Korea and China. And what the South Koreans do, and that's the actual source of that, the COTRA is the uh, South Korean Trade and Investment Promotion Agency. They go to all the countries in the world and ask them, what has your trade been with North Korea in the last year? 
and they get an answer and uh, that's called reverse statistics and then they compile these figures. So there is a huge bucket of salt um, that you should add to those numbers, but what you still see is a dramatic drop of North Korea's trade, mainly with China, it's over 90% since uh, 2013, in particular then since uh, 2015, 16. So for 2018, that's the latest number we have. There are some estimates for 2019 already. Uh, it hasn't really uh, recovered. So we have very, very low um, export figures in particular, uh, which is why South Korean numbers, for example, of North Korea on North Korea's economic growth are very pessimistic because they usually have a very strong correlation with these trade figures. So is that the Chinese, yeah. is that the Chinese um, clamping down on exports? What, what's going on there? Maybe you're about to say. Well, that's, that's a good question. Again, that's the official trade figures, right? So that's what the Chinese report. And uh, it's up to you to decide how much you want to trust the Chinese on an issue that is of strategic importance to them. But, um, well, yes, of course, the Chinese for a moment actually had joined the uh, international efforts at sanctioning North Korea. Um, sanctions had become much more severe and also universal in 2016, 2017, in particular with the Donald Trump taking office. So, um, and the Chinese... Um, at that point, it seems wanted to uh, still have good relations with Washington. So at least officially, they actually complied. We do know that there have been various cases of sanction evasion, and these statistics do not reflect in any way what is happening across the two rivers that we have between North Korea and China. But that's the official Chinese customs data being then um, reported to Kotra. So that's how this looks like. Uh, again. Questions about causes are always a bit uh, dangerous because, frankly, we don't really know. And I'm pretty sure that uh, the Chinese are not telling us, well, to put it mildly, they are not telling us the whole truth uh, in this case, because obviously that's a very sensitive matter. Okay. Um, something that uh, is alarming when you think about North Korea's economy as such is their trade deficit. And these are cumulative figures. Um, I basically entered the trade deficit in 2000, uh, in, in 1990, then I added a deficit of 1991, and so on and so on. And so you see that we actually arrive at about 25, 26 billion in 2018. And in the best year, uh, the North Koreans had a, an export volume of uh, 3.5 billion per year. So this is um, really a massive uh, figure, and nobody knows how they finance that because they obviously don't get any international loans. Uh, they can't print their own dollars. Well, some people say they, they can, but uh, you know what I mean? So their own currency is basically worthless. It's not accepted uh, internationally. So that's a big mystery. And this um, will eventually pose huge issues for North Korea's economy as well. Okay, enough with numbers. Uh, these are just some um, thoughts on other signs of trouble, including those I had already mentioned, like the numbers not adding up and the continued gap between revenue and expenditure growth rates and this chronic trade deficit. Um, the uh, North Koreans also made some strange claims, like for example, that the peak year level of grain production was exceeded in 2019. But if you then try to find data supporting that, it doesn't really look very good. So nobody knows where this claim is actually coming from. More, uh, even more serious is the fact that the five-year economic development plan that used to be a big deal in the last years almost completely disappeared from the media. And when I say disappeared, it's not just that they stopped talking about it. They actually started editing posters that uh, included some reference to that uh, plan out of videos um, and TV programs and so on and so on. So there must be something going on there. It seems that they are not able to keep the goals of that development plan. So uh, they want to I don't know, make it disappear. I have no idea why, because of course people aren't stupid. I mean, they've been living for four years next to a poster telling them about five-year development plan. So editing it out doesn't really mean it erases it from I've their memory. I've got one in my kitchen. I've got one of those five-year development plans with a beautiful. So you 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 better get you better get rid of it, Nick. Um, you're not on the official state line anymore. Not good. <laughs> no, not, not good, indeed. Um, well, they also issued bonds um, in spring 2020. Now, uh, it's North Korea, right? So it's not like they issue state bonds on a regular basis. The last time they did so was in 2003. 
And back then it was quite bizarre, actually. These bonds were more like a lottery, so it's not like you have a fixed interest rate, um, but uh, you could win <laughs> some amount of money if you were lucky or not. Um, the thing is, these seem to be foreign currency bonds, so they wanted people to exchange their dollars into those bonds. And they had separate bonds for enterprises and for individuals. Um, nobody really knows what that's supposed to mean, uh, but then again, it's North Korea. So they usually, they, they do things in the same way year by year by year. So when they do something unusual like this, um, that always raises eyebrows and uh, you wonder what it means. And in, since it's the year 2020 and since they have been under heavy sanctions for such a long time, uh, this is pretty surely an indicator of some economic troubles where they try to recruit whatever they have domestically because foreign trade and foreign sources do not function anymore. This next also, one is, is fascinating. The next one on the list is absolutely amazing. That which one? Your self criticism. Oh yes, I mean, the, I, I I should say they are actually very often self critical. If you really have nothing to do, um, you can Google uh, the web for my, or I can actually send you the link for my rather detailed analysis of Kim Jong Un's speech at the 2016 Party Congress, and you would be really surprised what he had to say to his officials about their, their performance and the country. I mean, we, we talk about corruption, uh, laziness, uh, pretending to work while not working, not serving the people properly, and so on and so on. It was pretty rough. Um, but this is the first time I found such a criticism in the budget report. Uh, and I've been reading those for over 20 years. So um, this is, again, very, very unusual. And if you read Korean, that's why I added the original version, just in case you wonder, maybe I made a translation mistake. I don't think I did. Um, so drawbacks in executing the state budget, that's a, quite an interesting remark. Nobody knows what that actually means again. But so, you know, it's all up for speculation, um, but still quite interesting. And then we have this denial of COVID-19 cases. Very explicitly, they said we didn't have a single case. On the other hand, if you look at North Korean propaganda or media these days, everyone is wearing a mask. And in the budget or cabinet report on the economy, you also have this, we subordinate everything to health and safety of the people. So there is this sense of urgency uh, clearly there. Um, we can perhaps, if you like, talk about COVID-19 and North Korea later, um, if that interests you. Okay. Um, okay, that is just an addition on the numbers, not adding up, just to show you what I actually mean. Um, the North Koreans say that 80% of um, their overall budgetary revenue consists of transaction taxes and profits from state enterprises of those two items, right? So they make uh, up four fifths of the whole budgetary revenue. And then they say, oh, and each of them is gonna grow about 1%. Uh, and then you remember the overall budgetary revenue was supposed to grow 4%. So you wonder where do those 4% come from? And um, also other income sources like real estate, rent and economic and trade zones are almost down to zero. Again, these are official North Korean numbers from exactly the same report. And again, it's pretty unusual that they, how do I say that? They do not mm, push the numbers so that they uh, add, add up. In this case, there's an obvious contradiction here, right? And, um, and ju yeah. just to, um, to give us, the, these are the overall trade figures, but just in terms of, for, for people who don't know, um, what are the key exports? I mean, it's raw materials, coal, yeah, I mean, right right now, again, it's almost down to zero. Um, it used to be uh, coal and iron ore going to uh, China. Then uh, more recently, as wages started increasing in China, the Chinese outsourced their textile production to North Korea. So textiles uh, were actually a huge export item where they imported all the fabrics and so on. And then they basically added labor at a relatively low cost and then re-exported all those uh, textile products to China. But since we now have comprehensive sanctions, the North Koreans are not allowed uh, by the UN and by the US bilateral sanctions to export even textiles. So um, that's a problem. And the main import item has been crude oil. We talk about actually relatively small quantities compared internationally, but crude oil is a crucial input because it's about the only thing that they don't have um, th themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, all the other mineral resources that are essential for running an economy they actually have. And crude oil is a bit sensitive because um, you, can, you can use it for many things, including, of course, military purposes. But crude oil is also a main input for fertilizer production. 
And um, perhaps you remember the first time we saw Kim Jong-un again after a long period of absence was actually during the opening of a fertilizer factory. Hmm. And that is because they are now trying the so-called C1 chemical industry that is uh, using coal and other um, domestically available resources to produce fertilizer, which they absolutely need to ensure a stable production of food for their growing population. Okay, uh, yeah, the impact on some major issues of concern before I move to some of our photos here. Um, well, I don't see so far a major disruption of the North Korean economy and not really a massive economic crisis. Now, I should say I'm not really good at predicting things. Um, in September 1989, living in East Germany, I didn't see our peaceful revolution uh, coming. And a year later, Germany was reunified and I had no idea it would happen. So. Perhaps uh, you don't really believe me too much with my predictions. So, but all I can say is that there are no signs that would really indicate, okay, you know, there's something leading to a massive change. It's not happening. So if you think the regime should collapse very soon, um, there is no sign that this is going to happen, at least not from, the, from an economic crisis. And the point um, is that it's been through substantial economic crises before, more, more yeah. profound than this before. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure whether they would be able to, again, survive a food crisis like they did in the mid-1990s. Because now North Korea society is very different from what it used to be back then. Um, but, um, yeah, in terms of, you know, like, like it happened in East Germany, where basically that peaceful revolution was due to an economic crisis, uh, not in terms of food, but in terms of consumption goods and so on. I don't really see this so far actually coming in North Korea. You still have lots of opportunities for growth. Many people can still get richer. You have chances for upward social mobility. I'll show you a few photos also um, indicating that, you know, this new middle class emerging and so on and so on. So uh, these people are still busy making money and, um, that doesn't mean that they uh, march toward Pyongyang and demand um, a change of the regime. Also, if you are more like WMD or weapons of mass destruction interested, um, and if you hope that North Korea can somehow be, uh, how do I say that, um, bribed into giving up their nuclear weapons, like I think that's what Donald Trump thinks, like offering them economic prosperity in exchange, they roll over and uh, give up all their nukes. Uh, I don't think this is going to happen because the economic crisis is just not strong enough. Um, yes, on the other hand, I don't think everything is going well in North Korea. I, I hope I was able to show you some examples that indicate some strange things are going on, some signs of trouble, as I call them. So if you, for example, worry about proliferation, you should keep worrying because, I mean, that's an item they can sell, right? And if they can't sell anything else, you've seen the trade figures are down to almost zero. And if they do have to sell because they need to have income from hard currency, and if a gentleman uh, with a long beard, um, speaking Arabic, offers them many millions uh, for either nuclear technology or a nuclear device or something, I mean, they do know that this is stupid, right? And they do know that it is almost suicidal if they are caught. But if you are pushed in a corner and that's your only way out, they might actually go for it. So that's why I think we should really be concerned about these things. Nuclear safety is another thing. I mean, 2013 Fukushima happened in Japan, for God's sake. That's one of the world's most developed industrial countries. And even they were not able to keep this uh, genie in the bottle and this uh, technology under control. So why do we expect that North Korea is in perfect control of its own nuclear facilities? That can always happen. And if the economy is going down, uh, as you can imagine, you know, they will focus on survival and then resources they spend on nuclear safety might actually be diverted elsewhere. And that would also increase the risk of a nuclear accident in North Korea. Um, well, I don't really think a nuclear, a first use of nuclear weapons is really possible, unless, of course, the regime feels uh, threatened and thinks it's the only option it has. So if they have to go, maybe they decide to go with, with a big bang rather than uh, withering away silently. Um, stability of Kim Jong-un's leadership. Um, we would expect that if the economy is really in deep crisis, that he would have a harder time um, staying in power. But um, it's, it's it, I don't think we have reached that stage yet, although it is always a possibility. And another problem is worsening human rights. As you can imagine, you know, if people are busy staying alive, uh, they will pay less attention to human rights. The state will become much more willing to violate human rights, to be more, even more repressive. Uh, because uh, it's concerned about its own uh, security, et cetera. 
And then, of course, there's always this danger of another humanitarian disaster. Um, I hope that there are people like me who do care simply about those 25 million North Koreans who are not the North Korean leader, uh, but whose survival is actually uh, at risk if the economy collapses and they are not able to produce food, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, these are the dangers of a crisis, of an economic crisis in North Korea. And uh, as I said before, crisis isn't there yet, but we should really be worried about it because if it would happen, it would, uh, could have all those negative consequences, which is, by the way, why I'm so critical of sanctions, because they are pushing the country towards an economic crisis. And I'm not sure whether those who do so are aware of all those effects um, that can happen. There. Well, um, I think I talked about this. I will just um, now try to show you a few photos just to illustrate some of the things I said and basically setting us up for uh, the Q&A uh, afterwards. Could, could you just give a brief description of them as, as you go? Because there's some people who might not be able to see them. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> what you see here is two gentlemen in Pyongyang, actually one on a regular bicycle, another on an electric bicycle, uh, driving by the uh, uh, cultural palace uh, in Pyongyang. So electric bicycles are actually a very interesting sign of a growing wealth amongst the population. Uh, when I was there in 1991, uh, nobody had a bicycle because bicycles were banned. Then if you travel to North Korea with political tours uh, in Pyongyang, in the countryside, you would see thousands of bicycles being a very cheap means of transportation and a very good alternative for actually walking because that was the only other way how people could actually get from A to B. There is no really well-developed public transportation system. Cars are uh, enormously expensive. Fuel is not available. But these electric bicycles, they are brilliant. I saw them first, again, on a trip with political tours in Rastan, the special economic zone in the Northeast. And uh, from there, it seems they spread across the whole country. And they are fantastic because they can be charged by, uh, with solar panels. So you're not even dependent on the state supply of electricity. And uh, my rough estimate of the number of those, I would say about one third of all bicycles in North Korea are now electric. And again, I'm not just talking about the capital. I'm also talking about uh, cities in provinces and even the countryside where we've also seen those electric bicycles. Okay, uh, what you see here is, um, well, it's an old man with a hat under a tree with a, with a pump in, in front of him. What does that mean? It means that this is a bicycle repair station. And uh, so everyone knows that if you have a flat tire, that's a gentleman who's going to fix it. So there's not just someone taking a rest. He's actually, yeah, he's the, he's the handyman, you know. Um, and bicycles in North Korea are in heavy use. Roads are not always in very good conditions. So I think he has good business. And for a strange reason, it's always men, elderly men with some kind of hat. Um, different types of it, but uh, anyway. Um, and you see, if you look more towards the right, he also has an electric bicycle standing there. And that's clearly not in Pyongyang, but in the countryside. So um, I chose that picture because it also shows you that you have some individual private business actually going on in North Korea. Um, not yet a big capitalist or something, but still, I don't think that corresponds with the image that we typically have. And he's not hiding or something, right? So that is perfectly official, perfectly legal. And he even has to pay some kind of tax to the state. Um, this is a photo of Pyongyang and you see many cars standing here, most of them being taxis. And what is so fascinating about those, first of all, when I was a student in Pyongyang in 91, there were no taxis. So if you wanted a car, you had to call the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they would basically send you a car with a driver or something. Um, basically, that was a service they offered for foreigners. Now you have regular taxis, also saying taxi. And what's even more interesting, you have different taxi companies. You can clearly distinguish them by the color of their cars. So on the left-hand side, you have this... Um, uh, bronze reddish thing that's the KKG Korea Kumgang Group. Uh, those uh, green yellowish taxis behind that, these are so called Beijing taxis because it seems they have been imported from China where they have exactly the same color. And you have another company, this blue white taxi is another taxi company. Again, not something you would expect in a regular socialist country. In a regular socialist country, would have the taxi company, full stop. Um, but not different taxi companies competing against each other. That's not socialist, right? Com competition doesn't make sense. That Marx uh, and Lenin thought that competition is stupid. It's, you know, you have all these 
uh, resources that you use uh, to compete against each other, wouldn't it be better if you would have a mon monopoly? Now, as an economist, I know it's not always better to have a monopoly, but anyway, that's a socialist economic logic. And now seeing different taxi companies in North Korea competing against each other tells you that the uh, economic policymakers also understand that competition is actually good. It drives down prices, it increases quality of service and so on. And obviously there are people who are able to pay for that as well. The other thing which I think um, really surprised me, I think it was about my third or fourth visit there, was coming to a halt in a traffic jam um, when there were sort of two or three cars waiting at a traffic light in front of us. And I thought, oh my God, where's this? Because normally yeah. you see the women directing traffic and it's just superficial. There's really no traffic there at all to be directed. Uh, these know. women are all gone now. They have completely dis disappeared, have been replaced by traffic lights. Um, because, again, as, as you say, uh, it's impossible to manage all that traffic. Now, to be honest, here we, we speak about Pyongyang. So if you go to the countryside, you find much less traffic. You do, however, find taxis in other cities as well. I think, Nick, we've been to Pyongsong to, together. We've been in Chongjin. They also have taxis there. So that's not something limited to Pyongyang, although Pyongyang clearly sticks out as like uh, kind of almost a paradise city, whereas the rest of the country looks less flashy. But again, they are catching up. It's not the development that is only limited to the capital. Okay, this is uh, one of these buses that we talked about before we started the uh, official part here. It's, it's a minibus and you see people standing in front of that minibus and the soldier with an AK-47 across his back, uh, obviously checking documents or something. And in the front window, it says, um, it says Pyongyang Pyongsong. So that is uh, obviously the bus operating between Pyongyang, the capital, and Pyongsong, um, a major merchant town uh, slightly north of Pyongyang. So, um, yeah, and as you see, everyone is quite relaxed. There are women standing next to it. It's not like they're overly tense or something. It's regular, right? The military guys checking, maybe collecting a bribe, nobody knows, and then you move on. And this is... This is, these are privately operated, or semi-privately, I should say, operated uh, minibuses, because the state bus system doesn't exist. And uh, But these women obviously weren't in the mood of riding a bicycle all, all the way, so they took this one. And it's usually people going there for business purposes, sometimes for visiting relatives, but usually this is middle class, you know, going about their whatever enterprise they, they, they have. So that's actually very fascinating. And I'm not supposed to take this kind of photo, of course, because it includes military personnel, but um, I don't always do what I'm supposed to. So uh, that's the equivalent to what we just saw in terms of transporting goods. So again, smaller cars, kind of a mini uh, truck, minivan, um, and they can be uh, hired, they can be rented. You can say, okay, I have so and so many boxes of goods have to be transported from A to B. Then you have brokers, you pay them a, f a fee, and then they transport that. And there's also uh, actually competition in that field, as we know from North Korean defectors who now live in Seoul and who are able to tell us uh, these things. That kind of information you don't get when you are in North Korea, of course. I love this photo because it's so illustrative of uh, many things. First of all, you see a gentleman with a smartphone uh, on, on his ear. Um, smartphones are very widespread now in North Korea. We talk about roughly 6 million units and a population of 25 million. It's not like everyone has a smartphone, but it's, it's actually quite a significant num uh, number. Um, what we also see is uh, three different cars, all of them made in North Korea, or let me say assembled in North Korea. On the right-hand side, it's a Pokugi or Kuku. It looks like a Mercedes-Benz SUV, but it isn't. It's uh, Pyonghua Chadongcha or Peace Motors. It's a joint venture between North Korean state and the uh, South Korean Unification Church, to some of you also known as the Moonies. In the middle, we have the Samcholli, that's a minibus, and to the left side, we have the Kyupparam, that's a simple sedan. Um, well, no North Koreans, when they talk to you, they, they tell you they don't really like the quality of these things. They prefer um, Japanese cars or whatever. But anyway, um, the fact that these cars are available is actually very interesting and also indicative of the uh, many things that have been happening in North Korea in the past. Well, this photo here, I should say it's extraordinary. Uh, you don't see people looking like this a lot in Pyongyang. So you see a guy on his um, very sporty um, bicycle. Again, that's a bike you could easily ride in London. 
um, or in Vienna. Uh, so it's not a practical one, right? It's not one made for bad roads. It's actually a pretty cool one, like, you know, a race bike. And uh, look at the socks of this gentleman, you know, orange socks. And he doesn't really look like he's wearing a uniform. He has his sunglasses and he, he clearly feels that he's cool. And uh, also his body language, it's very relaxed and everything. Again, I should say this is still more the exception, but it is, it is there, right? So that is also a symbol for this new, the emerged uh, middle class. Perhaps he's the son of someone with importance. Of course, that we can only speculate. But it's not like they all are just gray mice, you know, uh, moving around the city trying not to stick out too much. No, you see this kind of people here too. Um, and whether you like them or not, this is what it takes to have an entrepreneurial class. And in a way, you could also expect that the government will have to react to the expectations and demands of this group of people. Um, I was at the International Trade Fair in 2018, and this is a stand where the North Koreans are selling mobile phones to their own people. So it's every, all, all in uh, Korean. That company is called Puren Hanel or Blue, Blue Sky. And um, yeah, if, if you see, it's actually hyper-modern Android-based stuff, and they also sell all kinds of other electronic devices as if there have never been any sanctions. We do know from trade statistics that most of the components are imported from China. They might actually be assembled or branded in North Korea, but it's not like they produce all that stuff. But they marketed, and uh, there was lots of interest uh, in this. Um, you also see the professionalism of uh, actually sales efforts in North Korea on the next slide. Here they sell health products. What's interesting is that on the top it says Pyongyang Wehak Dehak, so that's the Pyongyang Medical University. So even universities are actually now engaging in business, trying to use their um, their knowledge and their capacities for making money. So that also tells you something about the marketization of almost every part of life in North Korea. And I've visited the trade fair actually a couple of times, and I could see how the the, the way how they present themselves has become more and more professional. Uh, of course, they are learning from uh, China clearly. And they're learning fast and they're learning well. So they, it, it doesn't really look like a socialist um, company, you know, kind of embarrassingly also tried to market itself and everyone is just like, hmm, at least they have tried. No, this is uh, not so bad. Um, so for this kind of uh, product, it's actually top notch, I would say. Yep. And then you have North Korean supermarkets like this one in Gwangbok Street. Now that's not where you're where your every uh, working class person is able to shop, of, of course not. I mean, you would be able to shop there. You, you can get in freely. Prices are in North Korean one, but uh, stuff there is pretty expensive. But what I found interesting is that they have, for example, pineapples on sale, like you can see them here. And then again, maybe none of you will find it particularly remarkable because you, I think, have grown up with pineapples and bananas and oranges. But me coming from East Germany, I can tell you, I've never seen anything like that in any East German supermarket because these things are imported. You usually import them for hard currency and the state would never ever spend its rare hard currency for stupid pineapples. They would spend it on the import of machinery or raw materials or something, but not on that. But the North Korean state obviously does because there's a huge demand and because the state is also reacting to that. So this is actually pretty fascinating too. Um, yes, we have the Hichon power station. So they actually do something about uh, the production of electricity that is independent of um, crude oil imports. That's a big problem they had in the mid-90s because their electricity production to a huge degree was based on imports of oil from the Soviet Union, which then suddenly stopped um, after Gorbachev was uh, ousted and Yeltsin took over. So it takes a while to react, but now they switch to hydropower and other sources. It's still not like... Um, completely solve the electricity problem, but uh, it definitely become um, much less severe than it used to be. Construction in Pyongyang. Um, well, if I wouldn't have told you that's Pyongyang, I think you might not have guessed because it looks pretty good. Again, it looks pretty much like uh, China. Uh, modern architecture, um, it's looking pretty good from the outside. And I was able to visit some of these newly built buildings. They also look pretty good from the inside. And just what, was, for, what was the lift like, Rudy? And did, was there electricity at the time you were in there? Uh, yes. And in Pyongyang, actually, I think now in the last years, electricity is available 
24-7. There are very rare power outages during my last trip in May 2018. I don't think we had a single uh, blackout uh, in Pyongyang, uh, which, and again, in 1991, when I was a student there, we had five or six blackouts a day, sometimes lasting for an hour or something. So the contrast really couldn't be uh, stronger. Um, and I, I was just about to say, just four four years ago, I, I built my, my own house here in Vienna. And um, if you are a house owner, perhaps you know what I mean. Once you did that, you start looking for details, right? You start noticing things that didn't really matter to you be, before that. But once you've did it, you actually uh, have an eye for that. So with this kind of attitude, I went there and checked and yeah, I think it was pretty good quality what they have constructed. Now, I'm not an architect, of course, but at least uh, as an educated um, layperson, uh, I would say it's pretty okay. Uh, lots of more construction going on in North Korea, including billboard signs basically telling you, here we are going to build this and this building. Um, so the state finds it necessary also to somehow tell its people what's going on there. Um, and um, yeah, that's the last thing before uh, I will end my presentation. That's a photo of the place where the Pyongyang General Hospital used to be. Now all you see is a pile of rubbish. And uh, the hospital had been um, torn down. And this is the thing that they are now building. And I don't know whether you've seen that, Nick. Uh, you might remember the access from the Party Foundation monument then, you know, across the river Taedong up to Man Mansude Hill, where you have the Kim Il-sung statue. And it's right in that axis where they now built the hospital. So the uh, party foundation uh, monument would be so on that corner, right? Yeah, yeah. Up there. Now, they started construction uh, earlier this year. I don't think it's COVID-19 related because, um, again, the, uh, the plans had been made before and the old hospital had been dismantled two years earlier. Um, but one might expect that they actually speed up the project now because of their COVID-19 concerns. The other problem is uh, a building is one thing, but especially when you talk about a hospital, it needs to be equipped with all kinds of uh, stuff. And uh, this is where they need to import. I do know that the South Koreans actually offered to provide some of the um, medical equipment. And the North Koreans, being the North Koreans, said, uh, no, thank you. We don't want South Korean equipment, but if you give us the money, we would be very happy and then we will buy it in China and the South Koreans and said, oh, well, we have to think about that again. Um, but uh, yes, anyway, we, we will see how that happens. Um, I do think that in this current situation where we have Cold War 2.0 coming up between China and the United States, the North Koreans can more and more rely on China. It's not like the Chinese like them a lot, but they are still willing to support them for political reasons. And that's pretty much the same logic by which uh, the Cold War has worked on both sides of the Iron Curtain. You might remember how the US was willing to look the other way uh, when it came to the uh, suppression of democratic and uh, civil rights in South Korea because the Cold War was on and the same logic actually now applies to China and North Korea. So um, perhaps this is where their optimism is coming from. Yes, uh, this is just also something COVID-19 related. On the left-hand side, that's a tweet from the German ambassador to the UN. It's one of those moments where I'm really, really ashamed being German, to be honest, where um, I, I quote here, uh, the narrative that sanctions are detrimental to the humanitarian in no uh, situation in North Korea must be countered. I don't know why he thinks so, but that's the official line, and it also explains in a way the uh, behavior on, of the international community. On the other side, uh, you see GoFundMe pulls a campaign raising funds for COVID-19 aid to North Korea. They wanted to raise about 30,000 US dollars, but then because of concerns over uh, sanctions violation, this uh, funding campaign had to be pulled. So um, yeah, it, it tells you how the attitude on the one side actually impacts the behavior uh, on uh, the other side. And two weeks ago, I had a very uh, interesting webinar with representatives of humanitarian NGOs operating in North Korea, and they all reported that it's so difficult now to do anything in North Korea because of those sanctions. Well, so my conclusion is that on one hand, um, we uh, do see signs of economic trouble, and we do uh, know that this economic trouble, if it becomes too strong, might actually um, risk many of the things that we are uh, worried about. 
we do know that uh, sanctions have actually taken the form of comprehensive sanctions. So North Korea's whole economy is actually attacked actively from the outside. Um, so in a way, I think we are shooting our own foot because I don't think any of us is interested in proliferation or um, in another humanitarian catastrophe or something. But right now, it's really, really difficult um, to see how we try to actively prevent that. Solution with a question mark, um, that of course depends on who you are and um, where you look for a solution. I think, as I just mentioned from a North Korean perspective, their solution is to rely more on China. They don't like it. They're already too dependent on, on the Chinese, but they believe that the new Cold War situation will still give them enough room to maintain their own independence while at the same time reaching deeply into China's pockets in order to finance their whatever goals they have. Um, but still, it's a big question mark. And that was, I think, basically what I wanted to talk about. Thank you. Great, Rudy, that was uh, fantastic, fascinating. Thank you very much. It was really comprehensive. I've got um, several questions, um, but I'm going to encourage everybody else um, to start writing your questions in the Q&A box below. So please do look at the Q&A box and click on that. Um, and when you click on it, you can just start ty um, typing questions in there. So please go ahead and do that. Um, I thought it might be one, a couple of things. One is you talked about mobile phone use. And I mean, I'll just say that um, just think back to the photograph of that bus service. That's a private bus service being set up. And the reason that's being set up as a private bus service is that there's no bus service taking you from um, Pyongyang to Wonsan that's, that's a regular and reliable bus service. There are also checkpoints stopping you from traveling from one place to another. So it's very difficult until quite recently to have the communications between each town. But then if you introduce a mobile phone, and, and take the example of someone doing military service. Military service in North Korea is 10 years. So your son could be away on the other side of the country. He might have been in his base for two years and you haven't seen him. So you don't know what's going on. You don't know if he's got any food. You don't know what his situation is, is, is at all. But suddenly you've got a mobile phone and you can possibly ring somebody in his base or he can get hold of somebody in his base who can ring back home. So that was a, a dramatic change, and that was introduced in 2011, Rudy, was it, or was it a bit later than that, 2000, when was it? Because uh, it was a dramatic uptake in mobile phones, wasn't there? Yes, uh, they, they actually tried once, then they ran into security issues, then they dropped it. And then it seems they found the solution how to eavesdrop on their people and how to control communication, which you know is actually pretty simple. You have the voice recognition software and everything. There's a German guy who, um, did a very deep uh, analysis of the software running on North Korea's uh, mobile devices. And that's actually quite interesting. They have found a very clever way to prevent the replay of unauthorized media files. So if you, for example, download or, or whatever, get on a USB stick, a South Korean soap opera, you cannot really replay it on your tablet computer because it uh, requires a code that needs to be recognized by a software. And it does leave traces. So if you if you try to do this, there will still be a log file that you cannot edit. And then if the security people control you, or actually if you go online in North Korea's intranet, that can be downloaded. Um, so it seems that this was the reason why the state then um, actually agreed to this. Um, now, again, we had a huge growth figures uh, year by year. There was this one operator uh, from Egypt, or Orascom. That's how we can have all the statistics. Now it seems the North Koreans in their good old fashion are trying to push them out of the market now that they have done what they had to do. Uh, so they set up actually a domestic competitor to that mobile phone company uh, from Egypt. And uh, yeah, well, that's the latest that I heard on it. So um, yeah. it's still a very dynamic thing. But I, that was the thing that I wanted to sort of pick up on, which your talk highlighted, that we think of, um, of uh, North Korea, it is a totalitarian regime, but as your talk, talk made very clear, it is not monolithic. It is changing uh, dramatically, and the amount of um, private commerce that has been built up over the past decade is is significant. And for those who tuned into our one of our previous talks on North Korea, we had a young North Korean defector who was one. Her family ran one of those buses, and she was able to earn the money from one of those buses to to actually get out of the country. So 
um, you know, that that's proof of how effective it is. Rudy, we're, we're going to take some questions and I'm going to ask Isabel in the meantime to bring up some of these people. So, um, uh, Isabel, if you could bring up um, Simon Jackson, Hilary Matthews, just bring up any of the na names you see um, yeah. it, on the right hand side. And, and maybe, Rudy, can we take you past the hour? Because it's only in 10 minutes to now. Sure, that's, uh, that, that's fine for me. Um, I actually see the questions, so if you like, I can just read them and answer them. Uh, I think it gives people a lot of, the good thing is that it gives them an opportunity to okay. put it in their own words to you, and then they can hear Perfectly it. fine. But, that, but, but um, the one thing I also want you to talk about was the currency reform of 2009, because initially the government thought that the developing market economy was a bad thing, and something they needed to take control of. But then that changed. So can you just briefly talk about what happened in 2009 and why that was significant? Well, I mean, to, to start with, um, as you just said, North Korea isn't really mo monolithic. So you have different forces pulling in different directions. Now, not too different, of course. So we have no organized opposition against uh, the, the ruling uh, Kim family or something. But we have different opinions on how, how things should be done under the rule of the Kims, right? And uh, one... A big um, contentious issue had been, should we use the market or not in order to improve the efficiency of our economy? And they did observe what happened in Eastern Europe. They've seen that tinkering with those market reforms might lead into catastrophe from their perspective. Like, you know, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, finally sacrificing the whole Soviet Union. Um, there are others who point at China and say, oh, wait a second, you know, it is doable. Uh, and you can still survive and actually prosper, or they point at Vietnam and say, no, no, it's possible. So you have this kind of struggle amongst the advisors of whoever Kim is in power at the moment. And um, they uh, also did what the Chinese and the Vietnamese did, uh, you know, crossing the river by groping for the stones. So in, in other words, trial and, and error. They did lots of stupid stuff, and they figured out it doesn't work, so they tried to reverse it and then try out something else. 2009 was such an ill-fated attempt at a reversal. Um, what they did was a currency reform. In other words, they exchanged cash. Um, they basically devalued old notes and said, well, you now have to exchange your old bank notes into new bank notes. The old bank notes are not uh, valid anymore. And uh, they tried to take uh, liquidity of the market. They basically shed three digits from the old currency because inflation had been enormously high. And uh, it seems they also wanted to have a better understanding of who actually had been making money over the last decade or so of economic reforms. And that led to uh, a big chaos in the country. People who did not really want to tell the state where all their millions of won came from, they just threw them away, burned them, threw them in the river or something. But of course, you know, if you have to throw away money that you just made, it makes you angry, right? And um, so this kind of anger was one problem. So there were local, not really uprisings, but people really protesting against, not against the regime, but against single officials. So that really worried Pyongyang a lot. And the uh, semi-private or private economy came to a standstill for a couple of weeks, pretty much like our COVID-19 lockdown affected the uh, uh, e economies in Britain, I guess, uh, as well as in Austria, Germany and elsewhere. And so the North Koreans very quickly understood, the, the North Korean leadership quickly understood that this was a bad idea. So they, um, of course, went on with the currency reform, but they basically lifted their control. So everything was back to, back to normal very, very quickly. They identified one uh, North Korean official who was made responsible. Um, I think he was executed as a scapegoat. And uh, that's it. And ever since, we haven't seen such a radical attempt by the North Korean leadership to intervene with the private economy. Uh, they are now using more indirect means, like I just told you about these bonds, for, for example, if they really want to get some liquidity of the market. I think that's absolutely fascinating. And as your photographs um, showed, and I think anecdotally from when we visited there, you could see that uh, market economy growing bit by bit. You know, yeah. that's, w Whether it's the guy repairing bikes at the side of the road or I remember somebody selling Chinese crisp packets. I mean, that shows you that's a uh, consumer. Somebody can go and buy a, a, a packet of crisps. They've got ex a, bit, a little bit of extra cash to do so. Um, that was down uh, in, um, what's it called, near the border in the south. 
I can't remember the name of the town now. Um, anyway, let's let's take some questions now. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a couple of questions at a time, so Rudy can ask them both. So Simon Jackson and then Hilary Matthews, can we have both your questions? So Simon, quickly. Good. Hi. Good to see you. Um, Hi, Simon. <laughs> why did the um, the Kim Trump bromance fall apart? I mean, it may have been BS, but it would seem to have had mutually beneficial objects. Okay, let's take let's but let's bank that one. Simon and uh, Rudy can know each other because Simon travelled on one of our tours with Rudy. Right. A memorable tour it was. Hilary Matthews, let's take your question too as well. Hilary, you just open your microphone as well, Hilary. There you go. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just interested about the very very rural areas. If you were able to travel to them, or you know anything about them, away from the population centres, is there a lot of poverty? One has heard stories about starvation and poverty in the areas that that. And can you go to them? A. Can you go to them as a foreigner? And B. When you travel around the country, do you still have to have a government minder with you all the time? I, I think it's a really good question. I will answer that question, Hillary, in part. Um, when we travelled to North Korea, we had a choice of about 900 permitted places that we could choose to go, go to. And so we tried to choose places that would tell a story about the economy, about society, and try and do less of the museums and monuments, although um, monuments of the leader are a key part of, um, of, of North Korean society. You know, everyone has to go and present flowers and bow at particular times. But that, I think it's a really good question. We did get out into rural areas, but nevertheless, we were only allowed to go to permitted places. Rudy, do you want to answer both the, both those yeah. both Simon and Hillary's questions? So maybe I start with the last one since you already started answering it. Um, yes, you can go to rural areas, and sometimes um, if you really get lucky, uh, you go to areas you were not supposed to visit. For example, if a road is blocked, um, if you're really keen on that, my suggestion would be go in late August or early September, because that's after the torrential rainfall in North Korea, which usually washes bridges away and uh, damages roads, etc. And since um, they are still pretty service oriented in the tourism industry, they try to get you to a place where you actually were su supposed to be. So they take a detour. And those detours typically end up being enormously interesting because it means you end up in areas that have not been basically not been cleared for access by uh, tourists. So, um, but there are of course also official rural spots that you can visit, like for example, the Chongsanri Cooperative, for example, um, and a number of uh, others. So what do you see there? Um, your question was, uh, is it very poor? Well, yes and no. Uh, it is extremely poor if you compare it to the UK or to Austria or to Germany. It's not so poor if you compare it to Madagascar, where I've been traveling as well. Um, that's, that's really in the eye of the beholder. If you compare it to Pyongyang, there's a huge gap. Like people live in one-story houses. They do have electricity. What they often do not have is running water. So you still have those wells that they drill in the ground. And these uh, wells are a source of infection with all kinds of bacteria because they use, um, well, biological uh, fertilizer, you know, to use this uh, word. Basically, you know, they have their toilets and then they let them dry out and then they use this stuff to distribute it on the fields and in uh, late winter, early spring. And then, you know, you have this vicious uh, cycle, right? Uh, that's why um, perhaps you heard that story about the North Korean defector, a soldier who actually crossed the 30th parallel, got shot a couple of times, then they brought him to a South Korean hospital and figured out that his stomach was full of worms, right? Um, so that, that is not a single, uh, not a unique case. It actually happens quite a lot. Uh, I was told by people that about 100 years ago, we had that in Germany too. Uh, we got rid of it. But the uh, hygienic standards, especially in the countryside, are pretty bad. Um, electricity they have. And if they don't have electricity, uh, they now have those solar panels, which tend to be a huge blessing. Um, so solar panels you see everywhere, they are relatively cheap. You can buy them on the market and that will, will be enough to power your, um, your, a few lamps and um, a TV or something. 
in terms of cooking. The, one, the point to say is that it, North Korean life is very, very regimented, no matter where you are. Yeah. All aspects of your life are organized. And that would be a stark contrast with many parts of the developing world where you see poverty and um, you know, the, your life is, is all, every part of your day is ordered. Yeah, it, it really, uh, again, it, it's hard to say that uh, the, especially the countryside is not poor in North Korea. Yes, it is. But then again, the question is, what's your benchmark? What do you com compare it with? And uh, I have definitely, I have seen poorer countries. And this is also supported by statistics. My colleague Hazel Smith has some interesting statistics, I think, from the World Food Program, for example, on uh, stunting, like, um, you know, the average uh, height of children and comparing that to some kind of a benchmark and the uh, stunting rates, for example, in N North Korea being an expression of malnutrition are higher than in many developed countries, but lower than in countries, for example, like Bangladesh, Pakistan, and so on and so on. So it's, it's a question of what you compare it with. Um, yes, of course, when you travel through the country, you can never do so alone. You're always accompanied by someone. You call it government official. Again, that's in the eye of the beholder who counts as a government official. If you are an EU delegation, which uh, I've also been with, then you actually do have officials from ministries traveling with you and making sure you don't get lost by accident. Um, but if you, for example, travel as a tourist, you have representatives of the um, state uh, tour company with you. Now, you could argue these are technically also government officials, but it's not like they are all clearly visibly um, officers of the state uh, security agency. They are, of course, trained specifically to deal with the tourists. Very often they come from um, upper middle class uh, families. And many of them later, after having been a tour guide, end up being, for example, as the diplomats. So this is clearly part of the elite. That's why they speak, for example, English. That's why they are allowed to have access to foreigners and so on. Um, so again, it's a big question. Are those now government officials or not? Representative of, of the state, yes, government officials. So, so, but as a matter of fact, you can never travel there alone. Now, Simon's uh, question, uh, the bromance between Kim and Trump. Look, <laughs> that is something I know nothing about, really. Uh, I'm, I'm just sitting in front of TV or my tablet computer and just keep shaking my head uh, in total dis disbelief what has been happening. Um, Trump is a strange phenomenon. And also the way how Kim Jong-un is dealing with this is, a, is really hard to understand. I think they both thought they can benefit e each other. <laughs> I don't really think there has been any actual sympathy between the two of them. I don't think even Trump is stupid enough to really believe that he's found a new friend or something. Um, what, who was that base, uh, basketball player again? Uh, the warm... Um, okay, ro ro um, Dennis Rodman. Thank you very much, Dennis. Well, I, I think he genuinely believed that he became friends with Kim Jong-un. I'm not so sure about Trump. No, I actually think they both thought they could be beneficial for each other. I think Trump really wanted to show that he's such a great leader and negotiator and uh, that he can really solve the problem that all his predecessors couldn't. And the North Koreans thought, look, uh, we always wanted to have a direct meeting, a summit meeting with an American president. And whoever it is, we will take it because once we've had a first summit, we will never have a, a first summit again. So this might become a new normal. And uh, if you have a more reasonable person, uh, maybe we can continue. Or maybe Trump is even dumb enough to give us something that we want for something that we are willing to give away easily. Now, as you know, it hasn't really turned out that way. Um, there is a lot of talk in Washington. But then again, I'm just replicating things that I really don't know my, myself about, uh, like, for example, John Bolton actively trying to torpedo all these efforts because he didn't really want that. So what you call the deep state uh, in Washington is also in play. And um, so I guess this is why we are now back to, to square one. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid this is all I can really say on that. I, just like, like you, I'm just a spectator to that show. Yeah, don't be afraid of not answering questions. Um, so, uh, but let's take Barbara Clark uh, and Laura Hamilton. Um, Barbara, you're ready to go now. Go ahead, Barbara. Well, it follows on from that, really, which is um, looking at the risk in the current situation and the sort of Cold War um, that you were talking about. Do you think a Biden presidency would roll back on the sanctions and the 
and the the Cold War talk. Have, have we got? Thank you very much for that. That's a, a good question. Have we got Laura Hamilton up there? I'm not too sure if we've got Laura as well. Um, I can't see if Laura's up. Um, I'll ask Laura. Yeah, no, Laura, you're there. You're gone. Laura, your question. Oh, great. You, can you hear me then? Yes. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm I'm really interested in the family and in particular the education of the ruling class and the the leader's family because I'm very conscious that Kim Jong Il and his sister had education in Switzerland. Is that kind of thing still going on? Okay, so let me let me start with the Biden presidency. Right. If history is a teacher, um, no. Um, Democrats in the U.S. have been notorious for not really uh, rolling back any sanctions with the North Koreans for not being very forthcoming. It's not like in South Korea where you have the progressive presidencies usually extending the hand and the more conservative presidents being more harsh on North Korea. In the U.S., it's been bipartisan actually, um, and. If you think about it in logical terms, makes perfect sense. I mean, why would you, as a Democrat, uh, offer your political opponent such a wonderful opportunity to display you as a communist uh, by, uh, you know, playing nice with uh, with a guy you don't really care about? I mean, seriously, from the U.S. perspective, what is North Korea? It's a little nothing at on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. Um, it only matters because it's at the border with China. This is why the Americans are paying so much attention, I, I think, and this is how we should also see America's uh, policy towards North Korea. It must be seen in the context of China policy. And uh, in that case, whatever suits American interests, they will actually do. And uh, right now, I mean, you know, establishing missile defense systems to protect themselves against the North Korean threat is a fantastic way of um, encircling China. That's at least how the Chinese see it. And I mean, as a matter of fact, that's what's happening. Uh, it's a good excuse for still keeping troops on South Korean territory um, and so on and so on. So I think this is it. And I don't really see the, how, how a Biden or any other democratic presidency would actually um, change that. On, on the contrary, um, unfortunately. Uh, also, all those arguments about sanctions having negative humanitarian effects, like basically starving people whom we actually want to help, they didn't really help much. I mean, look at the record of the uh, holy... Uh, Barack Obama presidency, uh, absolutely nothing. Um, uh, so that's why I'm not very optimistic about the Biden presidency. All I hope is that at least they wouldn't be willing to go to war in Korea, which is always a big uh, danger. From a North Korean perspective, it's quite interesting to see that for about seven, eight months now, the official line has been, we don't care about sanctions. You want to lift them, fine. You don't want to lift them, so what? And uh, I've heard that through various channels up to a vice foreign minister I talked to last year in November in Stockholm, who basically repeated the same line. And I think, I think already said that this confidence comes from the belief that the Chinese will be more and more willing uh, to violate those sanctions or to unilaterally declare that the targets of those sanctions have been achieved. And that's why they don't feel bound to those sanctions anymore. And if you think about North Korea, a country of 25 million people with a relatively small economy, do they need anything more than China? If China will open their markets for North Korean products, fantastic. They can sell everything they can produce to China. If China's banks are willing to finance North Korean businesses, fantastic. What do they need the international financial system for? Um, so that's why if China is at some point, and still they are not, but they are moving in that direction, if China would at some point be willing to openly um, act against the um, expressed will of the US and also the UN, then I think North Korea is safe and I think they are expecting that. So Biden is not what they are hoping for. Okay, let, let's go on to Laura Hamilton's question. We've got to try yes. and rattle, rattle through these ones, but I'm going to add okay, okay. to Laura, Laura's question is that you, you've got um, uh, Kim Jong-un's international background. He wasn't, it wasn't known that he was going to be the heir when he was sent to Switzerland. That was done fairly anonymously. So maybe you can talk about his education and what kind of education the elite get. But then I want to add to Laura's question is, you know, what, what does Kim Jong-un want? Maybe that's, that's an enormous question. We don't know the answer. I to. have no friggin' idea what he wants. Um, it, is, it, it has been very customary for the North Korean elite to send their kids to get educated uh, abroad. Um, they had no problem with that because the uh, logic is you have to know your enemy in order to fight him more 
uh, effectively. So even ideologically, there would be no problem with that. Um, and that's basically it. Uh, yes, of course, uh, they, they, the brother, well, the half brother is playing the guitar, etc. Look, Hitler was a painter. I mean, it doesn't mean anything, right? Um, you have uh, French uh, education for African dictators. It doesn't make them well, better, better people. Why isn't he perceived as a threat? Why isn't he perceived as a threat, the half brother? Who? There's a uh, one, how many brothers? We've got one who's assassinated, and yeah. there's still another one, isn't there? Well, the well, the, the, the one who was assassinated was Kim Kim Jong Nam. Mm. I was actually in Pyongyang on February seventeenth when he got assassinated and saw it on the news uh, Al, Al Jazeera in my hotel room, and I was totally shocked. I thought, oh my God, now all hell is going to break loose, but nothing happened. Um, the other was is uh, Kim. I think what's it? Kim Kim Jong Jong Chol or something. Um, he is supposedly kind of. Well, I think the term they use is uh, effeminate or something. Um, there are rumors that he might be gay. Uh, in any case, he is not regarded as a as a threat. Well, that's so far all we know. But again, this is like third-hand knowledge I have. I haven't met the gentleman. I know nothing about the whereabouts of North Korea's leadership. So um, I, all I can do is refer you to the books that you have uh, on the market, one published by Anna Fifield. Um, on Kim Jong-un and his family and so on and so on. Um, this is not really something I really have deep knowledge about, simply because I don't have access to the first-hand sources. Uh, let me come back to that in a second, because it would seem to me that, um, that, that Kim Jong-un has been ruthless. There was uncertainty in 2011 when he came to power about who would be in control. Would it be his uncle? Would it be his, you know, his, his aunt? Would there be somebody yeah. else in the family who's controlling things because he was too young? But he came to power, boy, he got rid of people and th there was no question that he's the top man and he's the guy who's running everything. So um, uh, uh, that's, that may be partly why the, uh, the, the effeminate, quote unquote, brother is not taken very seriously. Um, maybe you want to answer, talk, talk, refer to how much he's uh, gripped power, but um, how much he's asserted authority over, over the country, which is unquestionable. Um, and at the same time, let's take a question from um, William Brown and Marty Ryan. Both of your questions are pretty similar, but let's take both of them. So William, go ahead. Hello there, great talk and fascinating to listen to. What impact is the current lack of tourism having on the North Korean economy? Okay, and then Marty. My question is very similar is, what kind of a tourism industry is there and is that any significant kind of source of revenue for the country? Okay, Rudy. Yeah, well, uh, if my memory serves me well, uh, but I think it does. Um, the uh, highest number of for Western tourists we had in North Korea per year was about 6,000. 6,000, not 600,000, 6,000 Western tourists. If you would say that each of them spends on average $2,000 for this one week that they usually spend in North Korea, you can do the math yourself um, in terms of how much revenue that would actually create. It's a 12 with uh, five zeros. Um, so it's not really that much. The really significant income um, source in tourism would be Chinese tourists. So there we talk about hundreds of thousands of tourists. At some point, the Chinese stopped publishing um, statistics. They did so until I think three or four years ago, but we do have estimates. The North Koreans at some point published their target figure of having 1 million tourists per year. And that usually means Chinese tourists. Now, the problem with Chinese tourists is they don't really spend a week or two in North Korea, and they don't spend uh, $2,000 or more in North Korea. You have many day tourists coming in from Dandong to Siniju and back simply for the sake of being able, being able to say, I travel to a foreign country. That's how a Chinese explained it to me. I didn't really understand the logic, but it seems to be kind of a matter of pride uh, traveling abroad, and not everyone can afford to fly to the United States or to uh, the Maldives or something. So a trip to North Korea will do as a as a start. Um, but this is about the dimension that we talk about. So perhaps income from Chinese tourists might be in the range of uh, one two hundred million dollars a year. Income from Western tourists definitely much less. So this is these are relatively small numbers compared to our economies. 
Now, if you remember that the North Koreans in their best years had a trade volume of about $7 billion, you still see that tourism is noticeable. Let me put it that way. It's not something that their economy really depends on, but it's also something that's very, very nice to have. So, um, yes, I think it's an important source of revenue, but not one, not one that is basically uh, life-threatening once it is gone. Obviously, now, due to COVID-19, tourism is down to zero. So all tour operators uh, have been told uh, that no entries will be possible. And they are actually all in crisis mode right now. Um, and uh, we had that before with the MERS and the SARS ep epidemic. North Korea also closed down its country radically and then imposed uh, drastic uh, quarantine measures on people who wanted to enter anyways. So I think it's fair to assume that this income from tourism is gone. But um, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, I don't really think there is an actual economic crisis now happening. Uh, we've got a question we'll come on to later from Yuri Vint, um, which I relate to Bureau 39. And I think there's also, is it the fourth department that oversees um, just of um, uh, the private economy or, or market? There's within the state, there are bodies that oversee uh, companies that have a, a sort of state-owned enterprises, if you like, and it's their responsibility to generate income. And those, the tourism industry falls within that within that sector. Correct me if I'm wrong on that one, on, on that one Rudy. Let's oh, there are all these offices and departments and names around. My impression is that actually every single enterprise is now busy making money. And uh, money means uh, US dollars, Chinese uh, renminbi, and the domestic currency can be exchanged into any of those uh, on a domestic market. So, um, yes, I think it's not just one or two bureaus, sinister people, you know, somewhere in shady buildings doing this. I think it's kind of a, it's a much broader effort. Yeah, and but, that uh, bus yeah. company, so for the bus that you had the photograph of, um, so the, the young woman we spoke to a couple of weeks back, said that you know that was permit while it was their initiative they set up the bus company they had to pay 10 percent. they had to prove what their turnover oh, yeah. was and they paid 10 percent to the state um yes. so you know there's the on ongoing taxation as well so it's a, it's a legitimate industry in a way i'd be really happy if i had to pay only 10 percent of my income to the austrian state just on a, on a side note okay we get the great potential north move to north korea and start business there um uh, maybe not <laughs> <laughs> um, let's take uh, Rachel Douglas and also Nigel Harley. They both got uh, related questions. So, Rachel, go ahead. Hi, Rudy. Um, Hi, to, Rachel. Good to, good to hear you. You mentioned early on that the population is growing. Um, and I wonder about self sufficiency in food in particular, how likely they are to be able to feed a growing population. And also, as a side issue on that, how much of the black market, the illegal trade over the um, Chinese border, is important in their self-sufficiency? That's a critical question, isn't it? Nigel, I think you've, your question is more or less identical, Nigel Harley? It's pretty much so. I'm just wondering, you know, how secure, mm. you know, or uh, the ability of the government to feed people so we do not have a repeat of the appalling starvation that took place, I think, in mainly in the 1990s. All those questions relate to each other, the market economy, the black market economy, trade with China and the, the country's ability to feed itself, really. Okay, now to give you just a few numbers, um, North Korea needs about 5 to 5.5 million tons of rice equivalent. You know, you can translate potatoes, etc. In, into rice. So we talk about 5.5 million tons to sustain their population, right? Um, uh, during the famine years of the late mid late 1990s, they were down to two and a half million, which means they actually had a huge shortage of two and a half to three million uh, tons, and uh, that is the backdrop of the uh, famine that uh, we ex we've seen also in terms of images and so on. Um, now things become a bit more complex because it's easy to calculate their food re requirements. All you need to know is how many calories a person needs. Uh, you have to figure out how many calories fit into 100 grams of rice or into one kilogram of rice. Then you multiply that by the population and by 365 days of the year. Then you deduct a certain percentage for next year's uh, planting and you deduct a certain percentage for post-harvest loss due to transportation and storage and so on. And then you basically arrive at that figure. So there we are actually pretty safe. Those 5.5 million tons are uh, a quite reliable number. How much do they produce, though? 
Uh, that's a very, very big question. We have statistics, um, official statistics from North Korea from the 1980s and 70s, where they claimed having produced eight to nine million tons, which would be incredible because then they would have a huge surplus. Now, we don't know whether those numbers are correct. We do know that uh, for last year, but again, the World Food Program has published it, but they, they, the graph says it's based on data from North Korea's Ministry of Agriculture. They claim that their harvest was 6.5 million tons last year. Um, experts dealing with this, they doubt that. They say these numbers are most likely fake, either because of a botched methodology or because they are an outright lie. So the expectation is that there's actually a shortage of about 1 million tons of food in North Korea per year. And this has been covered by imports from China. And China is sending that stuff to North Korea, not really for free, but based on long-term loans that the North Koreans themselves do not really expect to ever have to pay back. And this is where uh, concerns start, especially in 2020. We have to see in how far China's agriculture has been affected by COVID-19. And we have to see how China's willingness is to export grain to any country. Because now, you know, everyone is hoarding, not just toilet paper, but um, states hoard as well, because they want to prepare for the next, for the second wave of COVID-19 or whatever it is. So there are actually concerns that the Chinese might be less willing to export food to North Korea. And that might uh, actually uh, trigger a food crisis. Now that is nicely connected to the question of uh, across the border trade. This is something that is very fascinating because we have no numbers on it. You have those tens of thousands of people who basically on a daily basis exchange goods back and forth between North Korea and China. And it's very, very difficult, uh, difficult to measure the actual amount. One way that we apply as economists is we look at prices. And there is this um, Daily NK organization. Uh, they also run a website in Korean and in English. And they publish actually on a two or three weekly basis market price updates from major cities on the price of rice. And this is an indicator how the supply is, because if there's less rice, you would expect prices to go up. And this is all I can say. So far, prices have been enormously stable. There was a bit of a, of a spike in, I think, was it March or April or something? But this is now back to normal again. So, uh, so far, it seems that the uh, food supply is still being uh, guaranteed. North Korea itself has about 20% of, uh, of the um, whole area of North Korea is arable land. That sounds like very little. But if you, for example, look how much arable land Japan has, it's even less. So it is possible to uh, be self-sufficient in food if you have the necessary inputs in terms of fertilizer, in terms of uh, irrigation, in terms of agricultural machinery, in terms of storage facilities, because otherwise your food will, will rot away. And if you travel to North Korea in autumn, you see how they actually spread out, for example, all the corn that they harvested uh, or maize um, on plazas in order to let it dry in, in the sun. And then comes a shower and you know it all gets wet again. Uh, Post-harvest losses must be enormous in North Korea. So. Um, it is not just a problem of capacity, but also of technology and available resources to minimize this kind of losses. But theoretically, um, I think experts agree on that. If everything goes well, they are able to feed themselves. I really, what I really like about your approach is that you, you analyze things like food prices. You look at very precise things. So much of the things we hear about North Korea are, are speculation and, and based on gossip and uh, and what I really like about your approach is it's a very structured pr approach based on sort of what, what facts actually are known out there. So I think it's, it's a really, really interesting way to look at things. Um, we've got two, two more questions here that I really want to, to take in. Uh, one, from, uh, one from Stephen Redfern, um, which relates to COVID-19, and then Victoria Barclay. Victoria Barclay questions as, uh, her question as well. So if we can take Stephen Redfern. Stephen, go ahead. Hi, hi, Rudy. Um, I've really enjoyed your, your talk. Um, my question has two aspects, really. I was wondering about the, um, the news coverage in the, in the West um, of, of North Korea. 
Um, but perhaps you've covered that already insofar as it seems to relate largely to whatever the uh, relationship is between the American president, in particular Trump, and King, Kim Jong um, Un. But um, I've, I'm hearing very, very little at the moment. I, I hadn't heard about a prospective Cold War, a hot Cold War that you've been talking about. That had escaped me completely, and there is no coverage about that. Yeah, I think we've got to think, keep it fairly concise. So, so maybe um, let's just deal with this one um, <coughs> first, Rudy. So, and then we'll come on to uh, to Victoria's question in, uh, um, in a moment. So, just COVID nineteen. What what are we hearing about it? What um, I know that they shut the borders down. Um, there are no they shut uh, foreign diplomats in their uh, in their compounds. They weren't allowed, allowed to go up for some time. So it's clear that the North, the North Korean authorities are very concerned about it. But what do we know about the actual illness itself, Rudy? I think if can, I understand can, can the I reason, that, I think Stephen's is question is different. Can, can, can I just add to that? Yeah, go um, What I've heard about COVID in North Korea is absolutely nothing. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. Uh, you're, you're the first person I've heard about. There is no coverage at all about yeah. North Korea. That's, that's How much? Idea. How much have you heard about COVID in Hungary? Well, they, if they tuned well, in to our special <laughs> program on Hungary a few weeks ago, they would have had a lot. Okay. Uh, no, but this is what I'm saying. The, the, I, I think it's a very, very good question. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether I will be able to answer it. Nick, having a media background, maybe might even be able to do it much better than me. Media are, I, I don't know, sometimes I laugh about it, sometimes I feel like crying, or sometimes I feel like, kicking something it's it's just absolutely um strange really to, to begin with north korea gets way more attention than it should really i mean it's a tiny little country on at the other end of the world for most of us and uh, yes they have a strange dictator but look we have our dictators in many of the stan countries be it turkmenistan or whatever they built their golden statues we have human rights violations in many countries in the world where people are tortured, uh, where people are put in political no, really, prison. I'm going to pull you up here. Come on, this is deliberate. The North Koreans have got, um, they need it for leverage. So the rocket launches, you know, okay. the, the insult fine. thrown at Trump, it's deliberate. The news is generated largely by them. Yes, but other countries generate news as well. We just don't recognize it. So all I'm trying to say is, first of all, North Korea is really overreported compared to other issues that might be much more important to us here. Uh, yes, the nuclear thing really changes everything. However, we have uh, Pakistan being a nuclear country. And hey, come on, they found this terrorist guy in Pakistan. I mean, isn't that enough of a danger um, to justify more, recording, uh, more reporting about it? It's not happening. No, I think well, that's simply my not really very structured uh, academic opinion, but simply my personal uh, op opinion. It just, it, people are fascinated by it. I talked to uh, the chief uh, editor in, in chief of a, a German's major tabloid newspaper, Bild Zeitung, that's the equivalent of the Sun in Britain. And he told me North Korea clicks. So, you know, they have an online presence. And he says, whatever they publish on North Korea, people will click on it. They are fascinated by it. They know nothing about it, but it's just that so bizarre uh, that everyone is interested in it. And in a way, this demand now drives reporting. So nobody wants to know what's really going on there. Who, who cares? What you want to know is stories about everyone having to have the same haircut as Kim Jong-un. People love that. <clears throat> you want to hear stories about whatever uncle or something uh, executed publicly, but not just executed, but by an a triple A gun or by 200 wild dogs or something. That's the kind of story that people want to read. And frankly, media d deliver that. COVID-19, um, yes. I mean, we did have actually media reporting about COVID-19 in North Korea, but since there are no spectacular images, that was dropped very quickly. It was just a little bit of making fun of, yeah, yeah, you have zero cases. Uh, we, we don't believe you a thing. But that was not spectacular enough. And 
people were actually much busier with what what was going on in their own countries. So attention kind of diverted away, and that's why I think uh, reporting about North Korea recently hasn't but been. What, very one thing you could possibly say about North Korea is it's extremely easy for them to control the movement of people. There's not a, there's not a significant yeah. movement of well, people. That's, now we, we actually talk about COVID-19, and uh, there we have two factors. As you say, Nick, on one hand, it's much easier to impose a quarantine in North Korea because people are very disciplined, state is very re repressive, movement of people had been limited anyway. That's on the, well, if you like, positive side in terms of preventing um, the spread of any virus disease. On the other hand, the health system is under big stress. They do have a health system, I have to say that. It's actually more than you have in many other developed countries, but the health system itself is very ill-equipped. And especially when it comes to high tech, like all these breeders and so on that you need you know, for intensive care, they have it, but certainly not in um, sufficient numbers. Also, m medication is very hard to get. Um, in the early 2000s, I met a gentleman, a German actually, who tried to set up a pharmaceutical company in Pyongyang, and his business model was to produce uh, generics uh, because uh, he thought that international organizations who provide humanitarian support need cheap medicine in order to treat <laughs> North Koreans, and he wanted to pr produce that. But uh, that doesn't work out because there are all those sanctions. North Korea is a country in the world with, I think, about the highest rate of tuberculosis. I think they have about big problem. You have to pay for the drugs to get hold of the drugs. The, the last, no, but the number of infected, they have, I think, more than 500 cases per 100,000 citizens. Whereas in other countries, you have like 30 cases per 100,000. So that is a very, very serious problem and shows us that the health system uh, has actually reached its uh, limits. So, um, yeah, whether they have any case or not, we really don't know. But I can understand that they are so very, very scared and that's why they are taking those drastic measures of sealing themselves off and you know asking everyone to wear a mask and so on. Victoria Barclay's got a great question um, <laughs> and and <laughs> this is a this is an enormously important question for both people in North Korea and South Korea but one that is shifting but go on Rudy. Well the question oh, is sorry, about sorry, uh, Rudy, unification. Sorry, ask your question sorry ask your question sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, am, am I on? Yes, you're on your. I mean, thank you. Uh, such an interesting talk, Rudy. It's super. Um, as you were saying, I mean, the rest of the world has its own um, interest agenda for North Korea. But is reunification then just a subject of interest outside, but not so much inside North Korea? Yes. I mean, uh, unification is one of my um, favorite topics. So I don't know how many hours uh, you would give me for answering that. <clears throat> no, I, I'll try to be brief. Uh, yes, it's one of the many, 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 many differences between Korea and Germany. Being from East Germany, I can tell you that the unification was a non-topic in East Germany. We we were even we weren't even allowed to sing our national anthem anymore, because at some point it says, uh, "Let's serve your glory, Germany, unified fatherland," or something. And uh, in I think. 1961 or a little later, they, the East Germany dropped the goal of national unification and their idea was we have two separate German states. And North Koreans never did something like that, on the contrary. North Koreans are very, very strongly promoting unification as the superior national goal. You find references to unification everywhere. Enormous and unification monument on the... You have a unification okay. monument, you have a unification street, you see uh, slogans um, asking for peaceful and independent unification, etc. <clears throat> for the Arirang mass games, or however they are called now, you know, these mass games in a, in a stadium, right? Um, there is a whole chapter dedicated to unification and so on. So, um, well, that's the good news. And they have um, many concepts. Kim Il-sung himself has um, developed his great concept and blueprint for achieving unification, uh, including a number of actually pretty good ideas like you know, let's do it gradually. And first we have something like a confederation We have where we have two separate states with their own political systems, but kind of represented externally by one body, but actually consisting of two parts. And then we would slowly and gradually, et cetera, et cetera, uh, get together. He even proposed a new name for Korea because that's a tricky issue, right? How would you call a unified Korea? I mean, we call it unified Korea or Korea, 
but the South Koreans call Korea Hanguk, and the North Koreans call Korea Joseon. So they use two different words for Korea. So after unification, how you call the unified Korea? If you call it Hanguk, then all the North Koreans will be uh, upset and feel colonized. And uh, calling it Joseon is not even something that the South Koreans even think about. Um, so the idea was to go for a compromise, calling it Koryo, which is the name of an ancient Korean kingdom, uh, from which, by the way, the word Korea comes from that we are using in, in the West. Problem is, since Kim Il-sung had that uh, idea, um, it will not be implemented. But And the ordinary people, you very often hear that they really hope that all their difficulties and problems will go away once unification has been uh, achieved. So it's not just a state goal, but it's also something like a, a paradise in the minds of North Koreans when they think about the future. Um, in practical terms, it's a completely different story. Yeah, and interestingly, opinions have changed in the South as well, haven't they, Rudy? Between the older generation that has knowledge of a uh, united Korea, you know, from the yeah. war, from the war, and then well, the younger generation that's not interested at all. It depends. It's interesting. The South Koreans have very interesting statistics on that, and they are updated annually, and I follow this very closely. So, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. The older generation is much more interested in unification than the younger generation. The younger generation, when asked why they are so skeptical about unification, they usually say, uh, well, we have economic con concerns. We are worried that uh, our situation, you know, still it's already hard enough to find a job. And after unification, someone has to pay for it. They always look to Germany and think it's going to cost them a lot. And so they say, uh, we, we better go for a peaceful coexistence. All we want is those guys in the north not making too much trouble. Um, and of course, having access to China by being able to shipping goods through North Korea would also be economically beneficial. North Korea has mineral resources, which would turn out to be economically very beneficial for South Korea and, and so on. But um, yes, this enthusiasm is going away. Interestingly, in terms when you ask people who are pro-unification in South Korea, uh, the nationalist motive is disappearing. So it's more like rational mo motivations, like uh, that would be, be beneficial, is what you hear a lot. The idea of, you know, we are of the same blood or something is still there, but that percentage is actually de declining. Um, so I, as a German, uh, as an East German, I should tell you, so what? I didn't want German unification. Nobody asked me. It happened. And now I'm really happy about it. So I don't really think this attitude of people in South Korea really matters. If North Korea would collapse tomorrow, of course, the country would be unified. There's no, no doubt about it, no matter what people think. Um, the question is, will it be a German type scenario? Like North being the weak part, basically uh, collapsing and then the South can just take over. That's the dominant narrative you have in South Korea and nobody can imagine that, that things would, uh, could probably go otherwise. Um, but there are many other options, right? And uh, I, as I told you, I don't have this gift of foresight, so I don't really know which one is gonna happen, but at least we should consider other options. And last remark on that, because it's something that I just recently found out, and I know you're not gonna believe me, but I have numbers um, proving that. German unification was actually uh, financially beneficial for West Germany. Uh, for the very simple fact, again, I have the statistics now that uh, the the um, amount or value of goods and services that the East German federal states bought from West German federal states after unification, that value is actually higher than the amount of transfers that the West German federal states made to East Germany. So it's not just the money that was flowing from West to East has been flowing back to purchase goods and services from the West, even more. So some of the savings of East Germans and some of the earnings also went back to uh, West Germany. So East Germany has a trade deficit with uh, West Germany. And we know that because we have this federal structure. And even though it's one country, you still have federal states having their separate trade statistics. So the whole narrative that the unification is going to be costly is uh, not correct. But right now, the attitude in South Korea is indeed uh, very skeptical. And I'm fascinated by the idea that we presume that unification means that the South Korean model eventually would absorb North Korea and that the communist system would collapse. 
But in this sort of new Cold War between the West and China, it could be that the Chinese economic and political system dominates the Korean peninsula. And in actual fact, South Korea succumbs to a North Korean model, yes. albeit with a greater sort of capitalist no. market. Look, I have been writing for a couple of years now, and there are now fewer people calling me an, an idiot or in a nicer way, but in essence, that's what it is. But I think I started doing this 10 years ago or, or even more, saying that North Korea could actually become the next East Asian tiger. Because if you look at the factors, I mean, if you study Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, People's Republic of China now, and if you look at these success factors, it led to this hyper growth, lifting a country from a very poor status to a very dynamic one. It's all there in North Korea, with one exception. <clears throat> and this exception is strong support by a very potent external partner, which was the US for Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and, and so on. It could now be People's Republic China for North Korea. Otherwise, we have a con Confucian mindset uh, we have a preference for education. We have a highly educated population. Export orientation right now, impossible because of sanctions, but that will be gone if the Chinese really de decide to play along. We have a strong state. Yes, we have a dictatorship. That's the same thing we had in South Korea. And in a way, you could argue even in Japan, where you had this one-party system under the L LDP for many, many uh, decades. Um, in Singapore, under... Um, I Kuan Yu, we had a dictatorial system in Taiwan under the Kuomintang, we had a dictatorial system. So that all these factors are actually there. And now imagine North Korea would go through such a development like South Korea did in the 60s and 70s. And let's say that takes another two decades, then suddenly they would be on, on par. And there would be strong forces calling for unification. Plus, last remark, since I know uh, time is running out, they have a wonderful thing, uh, they have a common enemy, and that's the best thing you can have for unifying people, having someone they can hate together, and that is Japan. Um, South Korea and Japan are having big issues, um, and North Korea hates Japan, so let's just imagine they reach a similar economic level, they start working together, North and South Korea being pro very pragmatic, China kind of pushing. And then you even have this nationalism that can focus together on the common enemy of Japan. So I actually see uh, clearly a very different scenario for unification as well. Although, yes, North Korea could indeed collapse tomorrow and then everything will happen as it did in, in Germany. But that's not the only option. Well, really, thank you very much. It's been fascinating hearing all these different insights and looking at things from a very different perspective. So it's been a really, really welcome contribution. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, next week, um, we've got a fascinating talk coming up on Black Lives Matter. Uh, that's given by Professor Tom Holt from the University of Chicago. Um, and his look is really to take um, a broader look at why Af Amer African Americans are still so disadvantaged in US society. So that's next Tuesday at 10 p.m. UK time. Please do join us then. My thanks again to Rudy. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a really, really good session.